You ready, Eric? You ready. All right. Welcome, everybody, to the Monroe Live podcast. Today, we have Jason Fenske from Engineering Explained. A huge honor to have you on the show today. We have Sandy Monroe as well. Um, we'd love to dig into not only how you got your YouTube channel started, but a lot, a lot of the finer intricacies of how you develop the content in your videos and some of the experiences along the way. Trade so, secrets. That's trade what you're secrets. trying to dive into. Huh? Yeah, but here, here's the thing. Before we do that, um, <clears throat> nobody at Monroe ever comes up to me and says, hey, Sandy, oh, it's great to see you. First two people that walked by, <laughs> by, by Jason, you, oh, yeah, uh, hey, uh, I, I'm Nick, and, uh, and I'm Han. It was Tim. And, I've, yeah. Wait, I've, wasn't Nick? Oh, so, yeah, it's Tim. Sorry, I've it's never Tim. seen Tim, Tim that animated. Yeah. Oh, he, yeah. His eyes lit up like he saw Santa yeah, Claus, man. Exactly. He seems nice. Also, Han asked about my cat, which, like, she's great immediately just for being like, how's Bucket? It's like, yeah. oh, Bucket's wow. doing great. Thank you for asking. Your yeah. cat's name is Bucket? My cat's name is Bucket, yes. Wow. Nice. That, and that's how you know you get a real fan when they know the, the cat's the name. The name of my yeah. pet, yeah. I think that's fantastic. Yeah, excellent. Excellent, good. So, anyways, uh, we didn't even bring him into the back area. I mean, you, you just immediately uh, attracted a crowd of two <laughs> but uh, but anyway i thought it was kind of amazing so anyway now you can have yeah, the show back so here. let's set the stage to get you mm -hmm. rolling here so sure. um early on when we started monroe live we were inspired by a lot of the videos you did and and other creators so yeah it's very it's kind been, of you to say yeah it's a, been a three-year journey for us but um so impressed and can you run us through like how you got started? You have, you have an engineering degree and right now you have like two thirds of a billion views just on your YouTube channel and 3.5 million subscribers. Can you just run through, you know, the beginnings does, and where we're at does now? Does 650 million sound cooler than two thirds of a billion? The, the, I, I think the idea of like 1 billion is very exciting and I hope that one day the channel reaches 1 billion views. Um, but it, I think it does sound less impressive than like 900 million. That just sounds like a larger number. Um, off topic. <laughs> I, de I derailed it immediately. Is that cool? Uh, yeah. So so early on, yes, I, I was in school for mechanical engineering uh, and getting my degree at North Carolina State. Um, and, I, and I went into that degree thinking I would learn more practical knowledge than I actually learned. Um, it, was, it was all math. Uh, in fact, I remember being like, it, differential equations was my last math class that was labeled like math something, math in some number, right? And I thought, oh, like I'm going to be done with math. That's cool. Uh, because I was naive and, and dumb and in college. And and then it was like, oh, literally every single class you take is a, is a math class. It just doesn't, it's not called math, whatever. So I had like zero practical knowledge, right? And and so you're going into the job world thinking like, well, I, I probably have should have like on top of some math knowledge, like some practical knowledge. And so I had an internship my uh, the summer before my senior year. So this is my only internship, of which I did nothing, um, like literally nothing. So I'm like, okay, I have I have one internship that I didn't do anything, and uh, and I'm and I'm good at math. And, and so like, why would a company want to hire me, right? Like those that was my thought at the time. So um, I, I was trying to think of like I need to put something on my resume that helps uh, sell myself. I need to somehow show that I actually care about engineering, that I want to that I want to do something in the world of engineering. So I created this YouTube channel called Engineering Explained. The idea not initially being that it was going to be automotive focused. The idea just being I would explain uh, engineering concepts on the internet. Um, that was Marshall Brain. He does the How Stuff Works books, um, which I always thought were cool as a kid of like, you know, it has like a, a diagram of a fire truck and what's inside of it and how the fire truck works. It was like, oh, this would be cool to do in internet form, in video form. Um, so that was kind of an inspiration. Uh, and then very quickly it became like automotive focus. So while I was at this internship where I had nothing to do, I'd start, you know, researching topics. Uh, then I'd go home and film those topics. And then I'd go back to work the next day, uh, research more topics, film more topics. Uh, so that, that was how it got started. And the initial idea was like, I want to put something on a resume so that I can get hired. Um, 
and and that helped. I mean, I didn't get too many interviews fresh out of college, but I did get two. And like having a, a YouTube channel in 2011 was like pretty novel. Um, 2014 or 2012 was when I was starting to, to interview with these companies. And that's when I graduated. And so having something to be like, oh, like in my free time, I, I work on engineering related stuff. That was like a valuable thing to show a company. Uh, and, and it distracts them in the interview and you talk about YouTube and YouTube was very new and weird at the time. So it was like a, it was a nice conversation piece. Um, and it eventually did get me a job in the forklift world, uh, which is where I worked for two years as an engineer. And then, uh, the channel got to the point where I could quit after two years. So I quit. Uh, <laughs> well, I wouldn't say it was actually at the point where I could quit. Like it was not sustainable from an income standpoint. When I quit, I was probably only making like 20 to $25,000 a year on YouTube. So it was like, it wasn't, um, it wasn't a great financial decision immediately. It was just that I, I thought if I if I put full time into it, it could become that. And I had safety nets to fall back on, so I wasn't really worried about it wasn't a huge risk. Like it's not like so, oh this So was, just out of curiosity, yeah. so twenty five grand to go into YouTube, what were you making at the Forklift Truck Company? Um starting I don't I don't know if it's if my contract says anything about revealing, but normal average starting mechanical engineer salary in twenty twelve was like sixty K. Uh, and I was right around that starting. Uh, I worked there for two years, so it increased as I worked there. Uh, but yeah, so it was less than half easily of, of what I was making. But, you know, those were combined and I and I had saved up basically six to 12 months worth of expenses in that if, if YouTube made me zero dollars, I would survive uh, and then I could get my job back. Yeah. And I, and I actually chatted with our VP and he was like, yeah, if things don't work out, like just call us. And it was like, oh, sick. This is yeah. even better safety net. Yeah, <laughs> nice. Perfect. Perfect. So where did you get your inspiration for your videos early on? And how has that changed over the years? Because I know you've you've covered a lot of internal combustion engine stuff. Yeah. And, I think, and those are my favorite videos, but go ahead. Yeah, no, combustion engines are like very fascinating. Like they're very complicated um, pieces of machinery. So early on, it was it was almost entirely from suggestions and the fact that like I had zero videos, right? And so anything could be a topic at that point, like even very basic, how does an engine work? How does an electric motor work? Uh, how does a turbocharger work? How does a supercharger work? So there was a lot of stuff. And early on, when you have zero subscribers, you just listen to the four subscribers, like what they want. They're like, hey, can you make a video about scuba regulators? And it's like, yeah, sure. Like, what else am I going to talk about? So I made two videos on scuba regulators simply because one person of like my 10 subscribers was like, hey, this would be cool. Um, and I think it's valuable to, to just listen to your audience and say like, what do y'all want? And then just do it. Um, so that's what I did early on. Early on, inspiration mainly was like people asking. Eventually, I realized like, I'm not that interested in scuba regulators. Like, scuba diving is awesome. It's fun to do but I don't really care how it all works. Like I just want to do it if I'm going to do it. Um, cars like fascinate me to my core. And so like very quickly, everything shifted. I mean, less than six months. It was like nothing that isn't related to cars is going to be posted. So very quickly switched to cars. Um, and so today I, I think the, sh the shift in it is that I feel like I've covered a lot of the basics as far as like, if you want a basic understanding of like how a car works, I probably have a video explaining that component. Um, so, so now I'm much more intrigued by innovation. Uh, and so I like looking at like, where are things going? What are unique things that companies have done? Um, that sort of thing. I also think like car reviews are an insanely competitive topic. Uh, so I started doing car reviews in like 2014, like right when I quit my job, I started taking in press cars and doing car reviews. And like very quickly, it becomes apparent, like tons of people do this and it's very hard to do well at it. And honestly, like it's hard to add value in that space as well. <clears throat> so I, I initially like did it because it was fun and I still kind of do it for, if, because it's fun. But if you can find one unique topic about you know, let's say the new Corvette, uh, flat plane crank, like it's a new cool engine and you can just focus on that. Well, the people that watch the car reviews 
can watch my video in addition. It's not competitive anymore. It's, it's supplemental. And I think that is a valuable space to be in where no matter what, there's a value to your video rather than, okay, there's 40 reviews of the new Corvette Z06. Which three do I want to watch to get a good understanding of the car? And then I'm done, right? Like I'm not going to watch all 40. Uh, so I think being in, in a space where you can be supplemental is, is key. Yeah. Yeah, and and you have your specific style with your whiteboard in a lot of your view, a lot of your videos. I mean, I don't know what percentage, but it, to me, it seems like eighty or ninety percent. Yeah, it's significant. Do you remember the first time you used the whiteboard, and and how has that grown? How much proofreading of yourself do you do? Who checks your work, and what do you do when you find out you've made an error, if you ever have made an error? Oh, I've made plenty of errors. Um, so the whiteboard started from the very beginning. I mean, the idea of it is like twofold. It's cost effective and it's simple. Um, and I'm lazy and cheap. So <laughs> you're an engineer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and in my core, I am. Um, so I, I wanted something that didn't require high upfront cost. And I wanted something that was easy. And like, what do teachers use to teach? They use whiteboards, they use chalkboards. Uh, it's, it's a very tried and true method. Um, and, it, and it doesn't require, like animations make for far, far better video. Like that is fact. Uh, if, if, if I were to animate my content, it would have done much better. It would have taken a lot more time, would have taken a lot more money. Uh, so having the whiteboard initially was just the cost thing. Why is it still used today? Because it's easy and I'm lazy. Um, yeah. I think that's the the simple story of it. The question you asked about um, checking my own work and like looking at the whiteboard, I, I do find errors. Actually, so I'll say one thing. Like if you watch a video start to finish, you might notice very small changes occur on the whiteboard uh, that, that <laughs> I don't point out that are like, oops, um, like I missed something or... Uh, I, I wanted to have something on the whiteboard that I forgot to put and it just magically appears like four minutes in and you're like, well, where'd that come from? And it's just like, I'm in the middle of filming. I realize it's not, not there. I do a new take and suddenly it's there. Um, but as far as the math, that's a, it's definitely a challenge. I think two things like I have severe imposter syndrome and I, and I feel like I'm not great at a lot of things. Um, but I, I am better than average uh, at math, and I also don't trust myself. And so I think the combination of those two things, like having a good intuition for what should this answer look like, and then getting an answer and it looking very off, it's like, okay, I know I've made a mistake. And then also not trusting myself, so like using many, many sources to find, uh, hey, this is the valid methodology for getting an answer about this question. Uh, and, and not trusting that first source you find, um, you know, making sure you have multiple sources that point towards uh, force does in fact equal mass times acceleration. And then you're like, okay, like a lot of people seem to be saying this, so I can, I can trust it and I'll go with it. Um, but like units is hard, right? Because like I have, uh, at this point it's, it's predominantly more global audience actually than American. So that's tough. And and it's like in in engineering, I think a lot of people don't realize like, yes, in in, uh, in America, if you work in engineering, like you're not going to be, it's very rare that you're working in, uh, you know, SAE units. It, you're going to be using metric. But you're still comfortable with both. Like when you go to engineering school, you don't just learn metric. You learn both and you become very comfortable with both. And I am. And so it's like I'll use whatever seems appropriate for the conversation. And people hate that. Like people hate whenever they see you know feet oh my or god gallons yeah. and it's like well it's what we use like what am i supposed to talk this is how i grew up like this is what i learned like the speed limit says miles per hour what do you want me to do say kilometers per hour when the sign right there says it's like yeah that's tough what we've been doing is we like what i'm doing it anyway i'm gonna give the whatever comes out of my mouth first and then i'll, I'll give the metric yeah we started giving both or the imperial yeah. or because if, or if we screwed up and we said we said pounds it'll, on the screen. It'll have, it'll, will translate Magic. for the rest yeah. of the world. You know? Yeah. And I try to do that, oh. but sometimes it's just like, it doesn't make sense in certain scenarios. And, and I'll have a good example here, but the context of the question just doesn't make sense to, to provide it in a certain unit, one or the other. Like if we're talking zero to 60 times, it's like, 
98 point something kilometers per hour. Like, do you want that? Like, no. So why it just like, it, it's a very American thing, zero to 60. Right. And so in the context of that, it's like, why would I use anyways? Yeah. Yeah. Getting yeah, distracted, get but, but units become a pain. Yeah. So you mentioned you're interested in innovative companies right now and you're sticking primarily to automotive, but do you ever see yourself branching out back out of automotive into non-automotive things again, maybe aerospace rockets, because you, you do have like there's other influencers out there like Everyday Astronaut yeah. who does a lot of videos on how rocket engines work. Yeah. And I, I found those to be very similar to yours. I don't know if you've ever seen those. Well, I haven't. Um, that's cool. Yeah. Uh, I like that the space is always growing. Um, I, I, I'm not as interested. When people ask what's the coolest experience you've ever gotten to do because of this job, like every time I go back to this, I got to fly in a Red Bull Air Race plane with Kirby Chambliss, uh, who's their pilot, and it was a two-seater Red Bull Air Race. These planes in competition experienced 12 Gs, the little dummy plane that they use for you know having a guest in is capable of about 7 Gs, and it was absolutely insane. Uh, and so it's like I have an incredible appreciation for planes, and I did this video on planes. It didn't do so great, um, but I, I am not as, as fundamentally interested in them. Like when I get in a a plane today. I don't know if it's Boeing or Airbus. Like I just get in it and I, and I go where I go. Uh, I don't know, you know, anything about it. Like I can look outside and like, look at the engine and be like, uh, yeah, I don't know what we're in. Like I, I, I am not nearly as intrigued by aerospace as I am automotive. Well, actually, uh, uh most people, most people, um, have no idea what's going on with airplanes. <laughs> yeah. How does they stay up in the air? You know, and you try and explain that and, uh, never mind. <laughs> uh, can I have another drink? You know, that kind of stuff. So, uh, so I think, uh, I think when you're in automotive, everybody pretty much knows that there's such a thing as a car. And when you start talking about the ins and outs of what's going on in a vehicle, you're going to keep most of your audience. The audience is going to be even if even if you are talking about uh, something exotic inside of an uh, an engine. I, we don't do too much engines. And I don't do them. At all. I'm an engine engineer. That's what I'm supposed to do. But uh, I've moved away completely in, into electric vehicles, and um, and there's still plenty to talk about. I mean, yeah, I sure. that's the thing that gets me more excited than anything is the innovation trail on on uh, the automobile or transportation industry is just absolutely stunning. I'm, I'm putting stuff together right now and, and, uh, stuff that I had put out six or eight months ago in the last speech I gave, it's all, it's all gone. It's all useless. Yeah. It's, uh, especially when you're looking at batteries moving from, uh, you know, in essence, the, the lithium ion batteries that everybody kind of understands the LGs and, and, uh, Samsung's and whatnot. These things are being eclipsed so rapidly. It yeah. isn't even funny. The, it's the, just amazing. The technology for the anodes. We just yeah. visited a company in California <laughs> called Amprius. They have yeah. a silicon nanotube anode. And they described on how they do the deposition of the silicon and it's porous so that it doesn't crack. I mean, it's 10 times better than yeah, using, uh, using uh, carbon. I mean, this is, the, this is the answer for aircraft. There's two, actually. The other one is um, do you, uh, SES. When, when, when these things come up, when these like crazy innovative things come up, do you have like a, a inherent skepticism? Because to oh, me, yeah. whenever you say oh, like, absolutely. whenever I hear the word nanotechnology, I'm just like, all right, so, stop. Oh, like, so we, no, <laughs> they, they actually, involved. so these batteries are in production. Yeah. They sold $5 million worth of the cells last year. Cool. And they're currently selling to Airbus and they're in their stratospheric uh, Amazing. plane that flies around the earth like, indefinitely because it's yeah. 60, 64 days um Very cool. 64 and days the big there. advantage is the anode becomes much smaller from a volume and weight perspective so they're well over 400 watt hours per kilogram yeah. and some of their higher end uh combinations where they have a, a larger cathode they're actually able to get 504 watt hours per kilogram and which is, is which is like uh teslas are in like the 280s is it super expensive? Like, what is the? What is, <laughs> I just found out. 
kilowatt hour, uh, the cost per kilowatt hour is a thousand bucks. Okay, so 10, that's 10x. 10x. And, 10X, and yeah. it's, this is not, geez. they're not but targeting. It's because okay, it's so that's small. why it allows for planes it's, to use it, but not cars. They're not, well, they're not actually, targeting automotive. Yeah, they're not at all. But the thing is, with with these guys, they've already got the building. They've got a million square foot building um, in Colorado. They're just waiting for the permission, you know, all these... Uh, characters that get in the way of progress they're waiting for the permission to to actually start producing they uh, they've already purchased the machinery and uh, quite a fit uh, quite a bit of this machinery usually the machinery that they're using who's standing in their way i, I feel like i feel like that's a convenient city councils excuse. that's I it's feel like always that's a the same excuse no it isn't it's because companies <sighs> companies find a way like that's what happens oh i <laughs> okay so i spent time at ford and i'm telling you what yeah. You'd be if you think that there's normal people that are kind of like not terribly bright, you haven't you haven't dealt with local politics. And I'm telling you, I I had a conversation when I was in Australia with a woman who actually became the prime minister. And I have never never in my whole life ever bumped into someone who is so totally totally out to lunch. No idea about profitability. No idea about jobs and and what they're. What but but she's how gonna... does a city council prevent a company from scale? <clears throat> Simple. You don't get the permits. Okay, but but again, you can find a way, right? Like Elon didn't like California, so he went to Texas. Yeah, and that's what you can do. So they they think these guys at Ampres think that uh, they're they're going to ultimately get what they they need yeah. in order to get things going. That's why they're sticking around. That's why they bought the building. That's why they've already got, uh, they, they put in their orders and actually they have a few of their specially, special pieces of equipment coming. It comes from China, naturally. There's nobody doing anything here in the States with machines, but they, they got all their stuff from China. It's being shipped in. They're, they're going to be ready to go here shortly. And why don't they want in? automotive? Like automotive is obviously a giant. Because um, they have no concept of money. They have no concept <laughs> of money. Industry. I mean, well, I, that's you why talk to city, city council. council. Stop them from. I, uh, here's here's a here's a for instance. BYD came to uh, a city that's just on the other side of the border called Windsor, and they uh, they wanted BYD by BYD wanted to buy one of the existing buildings that had been abandoned by I don't know one of the other big OEMs. They wanted to buy that. They wanted to put in buses and they wanted to make it work. And they said, we probably will pay more money to the people, so we probably won't even need to talk to the union. The, the uh, what was he, mayor or whatever, the guy in charge anyway, he killed the deal. Why? They went to Los Angeles because they got snubbed there. They went to Los Angeles. They put up their first building. Then they put up their second building. Now they're putting up their third building to build buses. When you talk to people in, in like the local politics, yeah, this is, you know, uh, these are people who in a lot of cases never had a job or they had a job for like, I'm a camera shop and it's closing. So I got to find something else to do. Everybody knows. Them. I think that's a bit of a generalization. <clears throat> Oh, I'm telling you, I'm, I'm, I never give like, you a, like can't a general, say all local politics. I'm all... not saying all of them, but I'll tell you what, a large portion of them. And all I right, am telling right, you, okay. it's, it's one Look, of these Corey, things. Get us out of this. Let's, uh, oh, man. let's, let's get up this topic. I just yeah. wanted to point out that there's innovation happening everywhere. Yeah, it is. Yeah. So not only the battery space and the motor space, so motors have been around for well over a hundred years, right, Sandy? Electric motors. Electric motors have been 150 around since, years, uh, since uh, the baby what is it? 1600s. Yeah. yeah. So and let me rephrase that in a some sort of form. Definitely not the kind of uh, motors that we're looking at now. But, but when we tear down, when we get a new vehicle and we find little tiny innovations, whether it's in the laminates, in the composition of the magnets, the yeah. geometry of the magnet orientation, the material in the casting, the thermal management. So that's the joy of our job is that we're doing these teardowns, whether it's a Hyundai, a Tesla, um, we have a Lucid in. We're doing a motor report on a Lucid. And and Lucid famously did a, a bunch of teardown videos on their own channel with Peter Rawlinson and their engineers. Yeah, they're awesome. Yeah, they're really good. Didn't get a lot of views, though. The first one did, and then they kind of went downhill from there. And 
I actually chatted with them about this on on what yeah. I I told them I was like if you were to do this again because this is insanely cool what you did and you obviously put a lot of time and money into it it needs to be bite sized segments and they were they were long for what they were like have a have a topic to your video have a one a one sentence topic that that's what the video is about and then end it in you know 12 15 minutes yeah i think when the first or second video came out sandy and i did a reaction video which we normally yeah. don't do but it was so good we're like man this is like monroe live and then there's a whiteboard that's from jason remember the <laughs> top down whiteboard i didn't invent the whiteboard too many people give me credit for this it's um, your style <laughs> it yeah doesn't it, is, matter. it is my style but it, i did not invent it like it has been a tool for teaching for you know i don't know how now, long but what, what would you say if there was a curtain behind us right now that's a joe rogan thing <laughs> think about it. you've seen joe rogan there's like the <laughs> he's he's the curtain guy this is another thing i actually don't like about YouTube. In some of my earlier videos, I said this, because this is a pretty common word, but you can't say this. That's on, Doug. On, yeah, exactly. And it's like, why does one dude own the word this? Like, <laughs> <laughs> I hate that. And like, wow. Doug's a great dude. He's like Doug? a great guy. I don't actually know him personally, um, but but he seems great. Uh, and, and the thing is, it's a bummer that things like that get attached. Like, hey guys, like it's Chris Fix. Like you can't say, hey guys, it's Chris Fix. And it's like, you can't say hello everyone and welcome. And it's like, that's dumb. It's just a normal greeting, but it's attached to my channel. I, I, yeah. I get irritated by that, but yeah, it becomes a thing. We've got, I mean, well, we've got, uh, hi boys and girls, which was from <laughs> howdy doody when I was a kid. And what's and, your, what's your, what's the age of your audience? Because you could say hello men and women. You know what? When you're as old as I am, <laughs> everybody old. turns into a boy or a girl yeah. so there I, you are i did catch some grief for a title of a episode once so i met dan mm -hmm. from what's inside all over you know in passing and we yeah. were in vietnam together and he he sat with myself and sandy and gave us a lot of different advice for the channel him and his uh producer guy's name's hunter so we've gotten really we're really good friends with dan and we did a video and i think eric titled it and he titled it what's inside a 4680 cell and he made a comment when I saw him a couple of months later. He's like, yeah, you know, what's inside? Like he he didn't like that I kind of yeah. uh, encroached on, like he didn't trademark it. Yeah. But it said what's inside. So. That's just a normal common question. And yeah. I think that's like kind of an unfortunate part of YouTube is it gets like very segmented. And it's like it's it's regulated by the comment section more so than, uh, you know, individuals. And, and the comments will just be like, dude, you can't say that. Like this is so-and-so's and it's like, you know, I, and, and people will be like, I mean, people will do that with like, if, if another channel were to have a, a car channel and they used whiteboards primarily be like, you can't do this. This is Jason. It's like, I don't care. Use a whiteboard. It's a very useful, cheap, simple device. Yeah. We're always getting comments. Like the one that, uh, the one that I had to change my vocabulary on was, um, oh, careful. at the end of the day. <laughs> oh, I thought you were going to say something else. <laughs> Anyway, this is I, recording. Don't say it. Yeah, don't say it. He, you know what? There's so many things he doesn't want me to say. Well, I really there's don't. a couple other. When words. you're old, you can get away with anything. There's a couple Ooh, other you words you that. you used that we had to tell you to stop using. I thought you were going to say some of those. Oh no! What's at the at the end of the day used to be one of my favorite expressions, and I was told don't do that anymore. And it, in the, in the comments and whatnot, so I've basically uh, excluded it from my lexicon now. So I don't. Well, I, I don't, I definitely don't want to hurt the feelings of the, any, anyone on the, um, you know, did, did <laughs> anyone saying watching. at the end of the day hurt people's feelings? They said, uh, um, say, there goes Sandy again, using what's at the end of the day. Same. When is he going to grow up or whatever? Anyways, I, I just, I, I was early on, so I just ditched it. Sandy reads the comments. Oh, I do. I read a lot of them. I only want to read the bad ones. I don't really, you know, hey, you're great. Oh, okay, fine. That's you want going. you want to read the bad ones. You enjoy uh, self inflicted harm. Yeah, it's uh, <laughs> <laughs> what do they call them? masochistic? Yeah, <laughs> but uh, no, I I think uh, I think it can get more. I I spend a lot of time in a plant. Um, when people come, when I go and talk to people about you know what's going on on the line, uh, hourly guys. Yeah. They're gonna. They're gonna. They'll tell yeah. me the truth. I'm not. Valuable not when I'm in the office. criticism is valuable. Yeah, and that's that's where I make all my decisions. That's how I figure out how to do something new that'll improve the, yeah. the facility. I mean, the, the flip is true as well, though. Someone can say like, "Hey, I really like how y'all did this in this video," and it's like, "Oh, great, we can keep doing that." Yeah. Yeah, that 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 happens, but uh, that's Corey's job. Yeah. Oh, now it's Eric's job. 
Yeah, I don't, sure. I don't. Pretty soon it's going to be great. Be disappointed in me, but I don't read the comments nearly as much as I used to. It, and maybe it's like a scale thing. Like you can only read so many comments. Yeah. Um, but I, I did used to read every single one. And now like if, if you want to interact and I'm happy to interact on YouTube as a platform, like the day the video goes live is when I sit there and I read and I reply to the, you know, the people who are yeah. there day one, yeah. like you will get a reply. Um, if, if you ask a legitimate question that hasn't been answered elsewhere in that, in that comment feed. Uh, but you know, a day goes by and it's like, I got other things to do. And is it just you? You do it's everything? Just me. Yeah, I do everything. All the production, everything. Yeah, everything. You, you hear that team of three over here? <clears throat> it's just him. See, well, again, it goes, <laughs> it goes back to what were the, what were the founding principles like cheap and lazy? Um, as you scale, I, the channel could could for sure be more profitable if I were to scale and hire, um, for sure, easily, because my inbox is uh, continuously full of sponsorship offers. Like it's just constantly there, every single day there are new sponsorship offers. So it could scale, but but with that comes complication. Um, I don't want to run a giant business. I, I have no desire to. Like I, I don't want to have a bunch of people to manage. Like I don't think I'd be a good manager. Um, yeah, go ahead. No, oh. I was gonna say, how's that going? For <laughs> you, uh, yeah, it didn't work out for me. I, I, when I started, uh, when I started consulting, I thought, you know, just me, one man band, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Next thing you know, there's a hundred people here. How'd yeah. that happen? You don't. It happens by saying yes. That's what happens. Like you, ah. you have to internally say no, and you have to internally say, I'm okay making less. I think those are the two things you have to be willing to say no to cool stuff. Uh, which is like a bummer. It's like you you have to choose your own personal life over cool stuff, which is lame. Because um, it's like, you know, you can only do so many things. And the second thing is like you have to actively tell yourself, I am making less money because of these choices and be okay with that. And I think both of those are very hard to do. I made more money when I was all by myself. <laughs> no kidding. No kidding. The, the, the year I started okay, the well, company, I made almost three quarters of a million. Well. So, but But at the end of the day, Oh, I did it again. Oh no, now That's I'm going back. Oh I'm no, I'm, I'm, I'm out ruined of now. That's enough for me. <laughs> That's it. I had to cut my tongue out or something. Anyhow, I will. Uh... Yeah. So our channel started kind of in reverse. We're an engineering firm. Yes. We've existed for 30 years and we started the channel to kind of get the word out with the model. Why not intending it to be a profit center? And I yes. was pretty pumped when we were recouping some costs in the early days. I remember coming to Sandy and I'm like, can you believe we just made 500 bucks for that video and it only took us 10 minutes? And now, you know, a 10 minute video, if it's really good, we can make, you know, five grand. And the goal is to grow to be where it's not five grand, where it's 50 grand. Yeah. And I can't imagine where, where you're at, your, your scale. Well, the numbers you're saying have, have scaled beyond me already. So maybe it's not possible, but. <laughs> really? Uh, with sponsorship, you can make those numbers happen. But without sponsorship, I don't know who's making 50 grand in a, in a single video. For, I mean, Mr. Beast for sure, but that's like well, a different scale. We, for our videos that are 25 to 35 minute long, 35 minutes long, our CPM and RPM are in like close to 30. Oh, so wow. that, because we pack a lot of strategic ads in there. I know yeah. people are listening. Hello. If you're, if you're watching an ad in this thing, but you know, we'll do two ads at the beginning and then one ad at eight minutes. So we'll have, Five, six, seven ads. Maybe and I need to chat with y'all because my CPMs and RPMs are terrible in comparison. Really? Yeah. No kidding. I thought you'd be over the top. So we, I like to track things in effective rate. So yeah. we're at about $16,000 an hour for produced content. So a 10-minute video, if you divide it down, is one-sixth of that. 20-minute video, if you, if you look at all of our average. Because oftentimes I have to compete for his time. Sandy could fly all over the world giving speeches <clears> and doing <throat> in, interviews. Yeah. So I and have. Yet here he is with me. We no, we have. No, some, you kidding? Some I'm white, happy to be some here. Some whiteboard guy. No, <laughs> no, no. <laughs> no, not at all. No, I, uh, I, I'm particular. I don't, I don't do all of these things all the time. I, it's I want to be particular. Yeah, it is. I mean, again, I'm old. I can do whatever I want. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So YouTube strategy. I'm an engineer as well. So YouTube strategy is is something that kind of consumed me. F for the first year to a point where Sandy came in my office and said, you either, need to, you either need to hire someone to do this for you or I need to find a new president of the organization. Actually said that to me. Yes, I did. Because I was sitting in there editing videos, yeah. staring at, you know, everything. Yeah, and like and everybody it. knew. Everybody comes <laughs> coming from the back saying, oh, 
Is is Corey just going to do YouTubes? Like, I mean, is he supposed to do something else? Yeah, so uh, that would actually here be notice. a really intelligent thing for me to do to hire an editor. Like, it would save me a ton of time. Uh, again, it's like I try to keep it simple, and there is, I think, there is reward in doing work that you don't enjoy. Um, like, ah, yes, there, there, you, it makes you infinitely grateful for the position. Like, there's really, really, really cool parts of my job, and editing is definitely not one of them. Like, I have no desire to edit. I never like had a desire to, to video edit. Um, but like it, it just makes you appreciate it. Like you're like, man, that day or two days or three days sucked. However, I got to like create this really cool thing, speaking with cool people, do this cool experience, whatever it may be. Um, I feel like it's like, it's like backpacking. Like when you go, uh, I don't know if either of you backpack, but you go out in the woods for a few days, you come back and you're like, man, toilets are like genuinely like one of the coolest inventions. <laughs> yeah. Like it is insane how incredible a toilet is. Yeah. And like you don't appreciate it because you don't ever not have it. But you go a couple of days without having it and you're like, wow, like a real bed and a, and, a, and a real toilet are two like incredible life improvements that we don't actually like daily appreciate. They're luxuries. Yes. Yeah, they are. They're for and sure. That and air conditioning. Actually, yeah. when I talk about innervation and the resistance, one of my, uh, one of my slides is... Um, uh, the reasons why we still should be using an outhouse. And this was uh, someone, a doctor, and, and he basically claimed that <clears throat> the fresh air and uh, walking outside to do your business is much more sanitary than doing anything in-house, you know. <laughs> and, and he always went on and on and on. So anyway, yeah. I take a couple of excerpts from that. And quite frankly, all innovation really at one time or another had detractors. Think of electric cars, for instance. I mean, it's amazing, amazing how many people want to just uh, stay where they are. They don't, Yes. there's no progress. They change is evil and bad and whatnot. They usually get forgotten, but, but, you know, and by the way, you mentioned toilets. There's the other half of that innovation, <clears throat> toilet paper. A wonderful thing if you've ever lived in a in a place where there's nothing but outhouses yes <clears throat> and sears catalogs <clears throat> yeah so your cars should we dive more into yeah. toilets no no, <laughs> no no so your cars you had an s2000 for a while I did have an s2000 because i saw you have a whole series of videos on s2000 and then you also have a tesla i forgot it was a model y a model or three, three. Yep. yeah and you started doing lots of videos on that how many vehicles have you driven because of the channel? Do you keep track of that? And what are your top three? Yeah. Um, because of the channel, I've driven hundreds. Like I haven't documented it. Uh, Jason Camisa, I don't know if you know who does video for Haggerty now. Uh, he actually documents like every single thing he documents, every single mile he drives. And he can tell you like the exact number of miles he's driven in press cars. Uh, I don't know the number, but it's in the hundreds easily, uh, if not a thousand like different, you know, cars, uh, because of it personally, like usually the cars that I buy it, it's more so a personal interest than this will be good for the channel. Yeah. Um, from that, I mean, I've had, uh, a Mazda MX five, which I put in it, the same style supercharger that's on like the Shelby GT 500. It's like the Eaton, uh, root style, uh, blower. And that thing like was incredible. Like a Miata with a little bit more power, like that's kind of perfect to me. Um, there's there's always three cars that come to mind whenever anyone asks, like, what's your favorite cars? It's like Mazda Miata, um, and, and part of it is is price. Like, it is incredible how much fun you can have in an ND Miata, any of them, honestly, but the new one is fantastic. How much fun you can have for the dollar. Like, I don't think it can be beat. Uh, Shelby GT350, I think is just an absolutely phenomenal driver's car. It's a bummer. The engines are a little thirsty. They, they go through some oil. Uh, they have their challenges, but insanely cool car. Sounds amazing. Drives amazing. And Jaguar F-Type. Uh, and I, which Jaguar F-Type, uh, so convertible Jaguar F-Type SVR, which like never would I think there'd be an automatic on this list, but ZF's eight speed like changed my mind entirely on automatics. It's just an insanely perfect transmission. Uh, and when I, when I drove that thing, like it's not a good driver's car. 
from the standpoint of like, it does things predictably. Like I drove it on track. I drove it at Laguna Seca and it's kind of terrible on a track. Like it falls apart. It's too heavy. It, it's very squirrely. Like it just wants to squirm all over the place, but it's hilarious. Like you can't drive it and not smile. It's insanely loud. It has all these crackles. Like they were early on the train of like the like pop tunes, the crackle tunes where you just have like, you know, retard the ignition so that you have fuel going into the exhaust and pop, pop, pop. So it's just so much fun, so loud. And like the happiest I've probably ever been in, in video, if you go to my F-Type SVR video, it's just like, I can't not smile in that video because it's so fun. So those three cars like are the ones that come to mind. Uh, when, when people are like, oh, what's your favorite? It's like, I don't know. I've driven a lot of uh, cool stuff. Been very fortunate to drive a lot of really cool cars. Um, I don't get that impressed by like $2 million cars because it's so out of touch, right? Like <clears throat> cool if, if, you can own one and you can drive one and you're in that exclusive club, but it's like so out of touch of reality. So to me, it's like, if it's less attainable, it's less cool, like almost immediately. And so that's why I think something like the Miata is just such an insanely cool thing because it's very tough to make something cool and cheap. Uh, and, and they did it very well. So I appreciate things like that. It's well, like I giving the you, mass is fun. I think one of the things that we have uh, kind of in common, I guess, is um, I think because I've been driving off-road vehicles since I was about 13. Uh, that's when I started driving um, a Wrangler. Um, and I have been incredibly impressed uh, with the, um, the, Rivian, uh, yeah. the Rivian I've got. I I don't believe that there's Is anything that yours ever. Yeah. Oh, sweet. The green my one? Mo- uh, my, sorry, my mother. It's actually my wife. She uh, She... Forced me to buy that. But you um, have one car between the two of We only have one car. Yeah, we have one car between the two of us, but she drives it to work. I don't. <clears throat> Not unless there's is like she four here? feet of storm. Yes, she is. Oh, okay. Yes, she's their COO. Oh, cool. Uh, Dr. Sue. She's got a doctorate in engineering. Talk about math. Holy crap. Amazing. My wife <laughs> yeah. is about to finish her doctorate. Oh, nice. Oh, really? Yep. In what? Not in math. Uh, in the world. <laughs> Yikes. In the world of, not in math, I was saying. In She's in the world of conservation, uh, biology. Oh. Um, yeah. Turtles. Is turtles. Her, wow, like, there turtles you go. Turtles is a research yeah. topic. Oh, cool. Very good. Very good. Yeah. Sue did uh, <coughs> uh, laser weld bond for aluminum <laughs> alloys. But anyway, um, <coughs> but uh, but I'm telling you what, I have never had so much fun in an off-road vehicle in my whole life. Uh, as I have had with the uh, with the Rivian, and as far as um, the only thing I don't like is that you're forced to use uh, the 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 terrible charging systems that are out there. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I'm 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 hoping that uh, sooner or later I can get whatever app I need app I need to uh, to interface. With the Tesla charging system, and I'll abandon ship on. Well, yeah, I mean they're starting uh, any of the it, other ones. It's small scale at it's, this point. It's yeah. the retrofitting of the what do they call it? The Magic Dock, Magic. Yeah. Yes, they got to retrofit all the right. yeah. charge stations. Though the Rivian off road, um, and and especially in the scenario of potholes, that suspension is just like game changer. Like it was like mind blowing because they were telling me on the phone call. I had a, a call with them about. Uh, the suspension and, and how it all works. And it's like, it's very McLaren like, um, except this is an off road vehicle. And so there's no roll bars. And because there's no roll bars, when you go over potholes, it's almost like they don't exist. And it is like truly like, it's, it's a different experience. And I wasn't expecting it to be as cool as they said it was going to be. And I'm driving with my wife down this, uh, you know, dirt road covered in potholes. Yeah. And, and I'm like, Tara, like, notice the movement of your head right now. And she's like, yeah, it's like, it's like barely moving. And it's like, this is insane how good the ride quality is. Yeah. Off road, on road. I don't (laughs) think it's that honestly great of ride quality, but it's fine. I, I, uh, I can tell you that my wife would not go off roading with me because her neck hurt when I got done. So, (laughs) and that was with um, uh, a Range Rover, a Discovery, um, and uh, almost every Jeep, Wrangler I've ever, I mostly got Rubicons, but <clears throat> every Jeep I've ever owned, she didn't want to go off road with me. This one, uh, actually the, the funny story is I, I bought a, uh, a Jeep, uh, Rubicon and it was the, the new, uh, hybrid. It was a PHEV. Yeah. yeah. So I, what about e? <clears throat> yeah. So anyway, I took it and we have a fairly steep hill on, on the side of our house. 
And I took it up and I got almost to the top, but then I could see that if I tried any harder, I'd either be tearing up the grass or I'd be digging a hole. <clears throat> One way or another, it was going to be a bad afternoon and I knew, and Sue was watching, my wife was watching me. And I dropped it into reverse and I just slowly drove backward. I went around over the top of our, our septic field. I went around that, came up onto the driveway. And as I come into the driveway, there she is with her arms folded. And she said, sell it. We did. I only had it for what, two months? No, it was and like 500 <clears throat> miles. Yeah. It was miles. virtually nothing because it ran out of electricity. Yeah. In, the in, range in is very 10 very miles long. or something yeah. like that. Um, it sucked up more gas than the, uh, than the 2013 that I had my, my other Rubicon. And, uh, and, and quite frankly, I, I just didn't enjoy the driving experience anymore. What the heck, what, what did they do? How did this thing change so dramatically? Does the four by E have the same <clears throat> style steering as the other Wranglers? I think it went to EPS. <clears throat> oh, okay. Because the engine shuts off. I don't think yes. they have a, I don't think they have a, you know, a normal power steering pump. Yeah. I think they, I think they, did you sure. have an EPS on your last Because it is No, not the 2013, like, but I think it was on I, this one. Wrangler is good at, it, at what it is intended to be good at, but the steering is genuinely terrible. I mean, it's no. Well, I'll tell you, <laughs> when I went up the concrete hill at one of the, uh, one of the local parks uh, for off-roading, and uh, I stood there and waited while the, while the other tricked out a Wrangler Sport was in front of me, you know, trying to get up to the top and he finally got over the top and I thought hmm how how bad do I want to be and I stepped on the gas and I spun the tires and one and then went up I mean these guys they they oh, you can ask Eric they they chastised me for going too fast up the hill You're supposed to go slow what for I don't have to go slow you do but I don't and that's kind of like the way it went and uh, finally they chased me off they go do something else. Uh, Jeepsters, uh, Jeepsters no longer want Who me in the club. Who do you like? <laughs> yeah, whatever. Anyways, like I said, I'm old. I can't wait anything. <clears throat> but uh, but I, I will tell you, I took that thing on uh, on a uh, quad trail. So I had to kind of like drive on an angle. Um, for a little while, for a very short period of time, I was on a bike track. Just, I mean, I didn't know where I was going. I didn't, there was a map, but... None of the crew would drive with me, so I was on my own. The only thing I was scared of was going into the, into the water because I took a rock and threw it in at the edge of this pond, and it just went, and I'm thinking, no, that is not going to happen here today. I am not going to try and get pulled out. Uh, no one will pull you out. I mean, nah, you don't have a real Jeep. So they would have probably just left me sink. Wait, Jeep owners judge 4 by e <laughs> oh, <laughs> you were there with the Rivian. Uh, that with the Rivian, yeah, oh, okay. not the okay. not the four by e, no, oh, okay. not that one. I was only I've only driven the Rivian, uh, okay, on on tracks. Now I would never dream of it, but well, you, tossing uh, tossing the rock into the pond, that thing's fairly heavy. That that rock went down too fast, as far as I was concerned. So that's the only thing I didn't do. But I I rode. I drove that uh, that Rivian on quad trails uh, uh, for a little while on a bike trail, um, yeah, uphill, downhill. Capable. There's nothing, cool. nothing. I couldn't, nothing could stop me. Zero. And yeah, you know what would be the one thing that I would say like is is truly like game changer in off road scenarios. Hummer EV is giant, so like that size is difficult. But ten degrees of rear wheel steering is insanely cool. Uh, so if you were to implement rear wheel steering, which has its complications and, and can be a mess, but it is, it is so cool off-road to have that maneuverability like the, the Hummer EV has. Now it's giant. So like the trade-off is that yeah. you're going to rub into everything, but you know, that's the biggest problem with GM's approach to their large EV that they led with. Yes. I brought this up to a friend the other day. I said, why didn't they take the blazer nameplate, right. make a Bronco sized vehicle, with nostalgic styling, make it look like the old school blazer, and electrify it. If they this had, is America. We want bigger. If, if they had they a moderate size, a Bronco-sized blazer that was fully electric right now, 
and they were scaled up on the Ultium platform, it wouldn't need a 200 kilowatt hour battery. It probably need a 150 kilowatt hour battery, maybe 120. Now Ram's going 230. I know. Oh my god. <laughs> but I I think GM missed an opportunity leading yeah. with that 9,000 pound behemoth. I think behemoth. we think uh, people want what cars we want, and I think they don't. I really? think you're yeah. correct, and 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 really and truly, that's why when I, when kids come up and talk to me, um, I you can get so much information out of kids that have no preconceived notion. Yeah, exactly. People that don't like cars, ask them what yeah, they want. Exactly. Yep. Oh, yeah. exactly right. And um, and the, the other thing that and, you know, everybody says, oh, you're always talking about Tesla, but you know, Canoe really. I mean. I've had more people come up and say, oh, I watched you doing donuts in a canoe. Man, I never, I could never ever in my wildest dreams ever believe that car could do that stuff. How did you like it? I actually, quite frankly, loved it. I thought it was, uh, certainly it'll be better than. Yeah, uh, I think their concept's very cool. Yeah. yeah. There's been vehicles throughout history that have sold phenomenally well for reasons that I cannot explain. Dodge Neon, the early ones. PT Cruiser, things, like yeah, yeah. killed it for how long? 12 years or yep. something? Yeah. Like killed it, and then and then GM brought one out, and it was HHR. Yeah, no one bought that. No one bought it. I thought that that was a a, a, a really well, whatever. It doesn't really matter, but they 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 died. Yeah, but I think like uh, the the more enthusiast you become, the more you start to appreciate like a lack of weight and and a lack of size, and both of those things like create huge challenges, which like. The Hummer EV is kind of like the opposite end of that. Hummer EV is actually like pretty impressive off-road, um, but it's giant and it's not efficient, right? So like there are there are things that go against like, hey, if you're going to create progress, this is not progress. It's like a, a slight step like diagonally up. I just think they picked the wrong vehicle because they picked the wrong name. Um, coming out with a Hummer again, they tried to sell it, um, you know, during the bank meltdown. They tried to cancel that car. They pushed it aside. And, and now, oh, we're going to bring it out. It's going to be an EV. My guess is that somebody way up in the, uh, in the ranks decided, hey, if this thing fails again, ah, no one will care. Do you think it's I that or do you think it's a matter of profitability? Like in, in No. Very few companies uh, outside of Tesla are making real money on EVs, so, right? And so if GM wants to make real money on EVs, Selling a Hummer EV for 150 grand is a better solution than a small Blazer that they lose money on every single one. Yeah. So I I have a theory on this. I've actually talked to a few people about this. I think GM is purposefully leading with very expensive Halo cars. They're not discounting them to try even to try to compete with Tesla's yeah. price cuts or even Ford's price cuts. And then they're doing it to buy time. So yeah, I don't think their infrastructure is ready to produce hundreds of hundreds of thousands of anything right, right. I think at that's... scale. So by leading with super expensive vehicles, you're going to limit the amount of people that can buy them. Yep. You will most likely break even or make some small menial profit early on to appease the shareholders in the short term while you buy time. I think yes. time is the most critical factor because they've been saying, we're going all EV, zero, right. zero, 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 zero. But they delivered two Hummers in the first quarter, two. I don't know if you saw that. No, I didn't. And I saw a truck go by with three Hummers on it the other day on I-75. And I go, well, there's 150% of their their production yeah. of last quarter. Well, but like Ford said uh, recently, right? Like it was like $2.7 billion that they lost last yeah. year on EVs. Like, so it's an expensive endeavor, obviously. And yeah. like it takes a ton of money and resources up front. And selling, you know, mach isn't profitable now. No. That's well, um, their scaling um, is like, like I think the, it's a cool car and yeah. it's cool that you can buy it for less than what it costs. <laughs> but yeah, there's so many other vestigial burdens that a traditional OEM has, whether that's the existing infrastructure and style of their plants yeah. is not set up for EVs, right. yes. whether they had a, an engine plant that was casting cranks and blocks and now you're doing electric motors or battery casing so you have all of this sunk cost in tooling and machinery that if you're doing another internal combustion engine platform it's not that big of a change it's you know moderate changes now you have to tear it all up so sometimes i think starting from scratch look what ford's doing with blue oval city down in tennessee they're just greenfielding it down there so mm -hmm. brand new blue oval city 
And I think it would be really tough to be in a leadership position at a traditional OEM because you yes. have to sustain your current business model on already historically tight margins in the automotive industry compared to other industries like consumer electronics. Look at Apple's profit margin. Yeah. They have more cash than like 95% of countries in the world. Yeah, I think they have a third of a trillion dollars in cash didn't they have yeah. 250 billion more I cash think? than most companies are worth period yep. yeah. they do almost yeah. all yeah. at the end of the day though i think that uh we watched tesla struggle at the beginning you know everybody came well, when are they going to make any profit when are they going to make well they didn't make profit for a long time but now yes. they're plenty profitable yes they're, they are without a question of a doubt the most profitable company electric vehicle company on the planet are they going to be there for long? Probably not. I think BYD is going to probably uh, knock them aside a bit, but BYD is going to have a hell of a time trying to get into the U.S. market. So there's a lot of things to consider, but I think that of all the car companies, the ones who are probably taking the they're taking their lumps right away is Ford. Ford, I think, did a made a good move in yeah. uh, in uh, in coming out with the with the Mach-E and, uh, and, the, and the Lightning. And we own a Lightning here. We have yeah. one. Uh, the guys love it. I mean, it's, it's quieter than either the Tesla. We have a Tesla Model 3 here. It's quieter than the Tesla, and it's definitely quieter than the, uh, than the Rivian. Yeah. Without a and, question of a doubt. And affordability isn't the only issue, because a lot yeah. of people go, well, you know, if EVs weren't 50 or 60 grand, more people would buy them. You can buy a Chevy Bolt right now, in the 30s, I think, and with the... I think the, they're hard to get right yeah, now. You can yeah, buy them for like the first time. They're it, actually becoming hard to get. Yeah, we're, we're right by the plant. You know, the Lake Orion yeah, plant Lake Orion is about two road. miles from here. So I drive by that plant sometimes on my way to work, and they're building, they're expanding the plant. They're getting ready for whatever yeah. else they're going to build there. The bolts, bolts are small. They're you want big. They're sm yeah, so they're small, and they lack... Uh, a lot of the features that a Tesla has. So the ability to charge really fast. I know the early ones, they had really limited charge modules on board. So they were, they're really just like, are they still slow oh, charge? No, no, not anymore. No, They've okay. gotten better, but, no. but I know people who've bought and used bolts yeah. and they're like, Oh, I don't even have fast charging. I'm like, what? Well, at the end of the day though, um, they did a, a major upgrade. So when the bolt first came out, I drove it around and I said, Oh, this is sad. This thing is never going to go anywhere. Then what was it? Three years later, something like that. Yeah. We uh, got a press uh, vehicle. We got a we got a press vehicle. We drove it around, and I said, "Hmm, maybe mm, you like maybe it. I've got uh, something wrong here." So I gave it to Sue, and my wife is hard marker, and uh, she said, "I can't believe it! I can't believe that General Motors put this out. This doesn't. This is not at all like the old one." And, um, and then she came on uh, and talked about it a little bit. She says, oh, I like it. It's peppy. It does this. It does that. It did, they fixed a lot. They fixed as much as they could without, you know, a tear, a total tear up. I don't it think I've driven Gen 2, but one of the things I noticed about Gen 1 Bolt with a B uh, is that of, of all the companies that put in one pedal driving, and I hate when companies don't put in one pedal driving, like offer the option. Right. Um, but of all the companies that do it, Chevy had the best, like, when you come to a stop, you had the least amount of, like, kick. Like, it was just, yeah. like, the smoothest transition into nothing. It was, like, very impressive. They're tuning on the, like, stop from, with, with, with one pedal driving. Well, and the same thing is true on the version 2. Okay. Um, yeah. it's, it, that, that is one of the aspects. And you can pick one pedal driving or... I think they yeah. call it cruise or something like that when you turn it off. I and just it, noticed uh, these were Tesla seats. Yeah. <laughs> yes, they are. <laughs> yep. Uh, this is uh, actually, I'm sitting in the chair that I use in my office. I think these are the most comfortable front seats ever. I, uh, Corey and I drove. Uh, what car are know, these out of? Uh, the S, Model Y. The S and, S and the Y and the okay. three. I don't know. We tear Sorry down one of each, so it could yeah. be one from each. And we, um, we had a bunch of other yeah, stuff. Yeah, I love and the we, seats in the three. I love yeah, them. Right. I'm, I'm telling you, they're, for a long trip, you can't beat it. Yeah. These things are uber comfortable. They, they get the biggest check mark ever. Oh, yeah. One other thing on your comment about GM's uh, one-pedal driving being really calibrated, that's what you get when you have 160,000 employees <laughs> versus FCA with 80, is that I have probably a 
half dozen friends or maybe a dozen friends that are calibrators at General Motors that, that all they do is calibrate stuff. So mm -hmm. when you said that, I'll have to talk to one of them yeah. because it seems like every fifth person I know is a calibration engineer at General Motors. So oh, yeah, they nailed it on, yeah. on diesel. Like it's, it's a really yeah. cool yeah. curve. Like, I don't know, if, you know, the average person gets in and appreciates it, but it was like immediately like, wow, they nailed yeah. this. What's up, Eric? Eric, you got something to say? Yeah, so we're at the one-hour mark, just to let you guys know. Okay. And then um, I do have a question for Jason. So we get – people send us your videos all the time, but there's <laughs> one that you did recently where the uh, Lexus versus Tesla yoke. Yeah, it got very popular. So many people sent us that. And why do they send it to you? I don't, I don't because, quite understand. Because we did a video on the yoke. We tore oh, one did you, down. Did you defend it? Did you say it was a good idea? Is that why? Um, <laughs> I don't remember what we said. I know we uh, talked we, about how it was we, the build quality for, and all for that. Us, oh, our, nice. our stick on YouTube is we do the teardowns. Yeah, we, I know. They're great. We commit to destroying $100,000 vehicles, yes. which most influencers or YouTube people don't want to do. It would not do. be profitable for me to yeah, do. Yeah. So because of that, we had the yoke out. I think we cut it in half. We talked about the cross section. We talked about the heating element. One of our engineers, Tyler, I think he did that, right? Yeah. So we don't, we try and stay away from car reviews and reviews yes. of HMI because there's so many people, like you said, there's so many people that are phenomenal at it. And uh, that's what we did. We just talked about how it okay. was, how it was built. Well, I, I don't, then, then they're probably, I still don't understand why they sent it to you, I guess. They want. Uh, they just wanted our reaction your, to okay, it. Okay, your thought. Well, let's get it. What's your reaction? <laughs> or have you not seen it? I, I, if you haven't I, seen it, that's fine. I, I haven't seen it. I can't even watch our own videos anymore. We're so busy. Okay, I can I can give yeah, you a give, quick 30-second yeah, uh, yeah, summary. Basically, so Lexus now has implemented steer-by-wire. True steer-by-wire where there is literally no mechanical connection. A lot of people in the comments rightfully pointed out, hey, Infinity did this. And it's like, yes, they did this, but there was they still that, a link. They still had a they link. That, that yes. a mechanical link. Yes. Yeah. So, so that's why to me, I was like, this is big because this is going to go into a production car and there's literally no link. Um, so that's what the video is about. And, and the reason why, you know, a steering wheel is a steering wheel because you turn it a certain number of times, right? A, a wheel makes sense. But if you don't, if you can have a lower steering ratio, like you see in, you know, F1. WEC or F1, uh, then you don't have to have a wheel, right? If your hands can always stay at nine and three, then you don't have to have a wheel. So with Lexus, you never turn 150 degrees one way or the other uh, is the limit. So total of 300 degrees of rotation of that wheel. And the steering ratio adjusts based on your speed. So you never have to do the awkward hand over hand motions. Now, like I will say, because, you know, people say people use Tesla as a, uh, a way to attract views. And it's like, for sure, for sure. That is why the title is what it is and why it's comparing. Like I got to drive this new car, but like you also, you have to do two things with the video. Like you want to get across a point that you're interested in talking about and you want to get people to watch it. Marketing is the first part where you have a title and a thumbnail, uh, but, it, but it does actually match. The content does match. And so I talk about why with Tesla, the yoke doesn't make sense to do because you still have to have hand over hand motion. I don't know what the number of rotations is. It's like, I, I stated in the video, two point, whatever, yeah. but regardless, there is a number and it's like, if you're reversing and you have to like look behind you, I mean, you don't really these days cause you have cameras, but there are tight maneuvers where there's no wheel where you want to grab. Yeah. And that to me is insanity. Like, and, and clearly people felt the same way. Cause they were like, no, we're not bringing a, a wheel back. We're just leaving it with the yoke. And it's like, okay, well time they responded and they yeah. were like, Hey, people actually really like steering wheels. It turns out now the retrofit yeah. wheel is sold out. Yeah. You can retrofit a wheel on. I don't know if you saw that. No, I did not. Yeah. But uh, to me, I love the yoke. Corey hated it. I think, so. but, but I think options are a good thing. Yeah. Personally, I always think options are a good thing. Like companies will say like, oh, we don't offer one pedal driving. It's like, why? Well, like, we don't believe in that. And it's like, well, who cares what you believe in? It's what the person buying your car believes right. in. Well, yeah. Studebaker believed in uh, mechanical brakes, you know, and they're still around. Oh, wait a minute. No, they're not. So <laughs> I'm, I'm real particular with steering wheels. I like them to be harder and smooth so they can slide in my palm of my hand. Okay. Yeah. This is not, if it's not a race car, this is my passenger car because yeah. I'll go around and then I'll, I'll let go and, yeah, I'll, and, I'll and have let pressure it, like yes. a clutch, you yep. know? 
And my Nissan Maxima, my third gen, I loved it. 2,800 pounds, 200 horsepower. It's amazing. Everyone knows I love Nissan Maximas. That had like a, it was leather, but it was so hard that it was smooth. Then I bought a 09 Yukon and it had a wood insert on the front, which was perfectly smooth. And now I have a new Yukon and it's like really supple, soft leather. And I can't, I can't get that same user experience yeah. and I hate it. And the yoke, I, I did not like the yoke. And isn't, it, I, I haven't actually driven the yoke, but isn't it slightly off center? Like the, the rotation is not perfectly central. Like does oh, it pivot about the middle or does it pivot kind of like in an, no, I a think small it, arc? Uh, we have it here. I thought it, yeah, it, it's you like down it a little down. bit. The thing that I liked about it was the fact that I don't have that, that ring to see. Yeah, I, I visibility see. is great. There are good <clears throat> reasons for putting in a yoke. Like like yeah. what Lexus did to me makes sense because they have the application where there's hand over hand never is necessary. So because you don't have that linkage going down, you can raise up the steering wheel so you can have better leg room, you can have it positioned better, and you can have better visibility above it. So everything is raised in the yoke version of the Lexus. The whole dash actually comes up. And yet you still have better visibility forward because you don't have that wheel in your view. Yeah. Uh, well, I thought we, it, we, we talked about it as well. I, and when we first got that car, the very first thing was, well, wait a minute, <clears throat> if this is steer by wire, and that's initially what we thought, this is steer by wire, we should be able to, you could, you could doctor this any way you want. It should be like an F1 or it should yeah. be, at least it should be and, something simpler. I think there's also a safety <clears throat> risk. So when you're driving your legs, can be pressed up against the wheel and when you start to turn if one leg lifts up the wheel can actually if mm. it's not a circle it actually can yeah. hit and stop so it's a great point and that's something i noticed when we were maneuvering through chick-fil-a drive through or wherever we yeah. were because we took it on like a four thousand mile road trip right. yeah and it just i drove the whole time because i have control issues and she does it <laughs> occasionally do we want to let it out right now yeah <laughs> mm. uh, you know we haven't got a couch here so <laughs> Sandy. Or a psychiatrist. No, Sandy drove <clears throat> a little bit, a little yeah. bit, and he got to yoke to yell and scream at us. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You took your hand off too long. Yeah, you just got to put a little orange on there. Is that what it is? <laughs> you know, people, people. There's like invented devices now yeah. that are just weights. Yeah, they weights. But uh, I didn't do that. He uh, pulled. We, we were we were in like Connecticut or New Jersey. And it was a long stretch, and I forgot you were trying to do something on your phone, and you just let go of the wheel. Go ahead, no, Eric. So <coughs> I was on the phone with Hilton, and I needed Sandy's Hilton Rewards number. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. And he unbuckled his uh, seat, seat and he went to go get his wallet out and took his hands off the wheel. While on autopilot. Yeah. Yeah. So it started These are all screaming good tips. and flashing red, and the car started veering off to the road. And, then it's, and it was a big grab red it. skull. And everyone's <laughs> screaming, and I'm on the phone. Yeah. And so did you get the number or was it too loud? We got the number. And it was <laughs> yeah, it was all successful. Nothing. No one died. I think there was only one person who shit their pants. So that, <laughs> that, that part was, that That's was me. me. That would be Eric. Yeah. Eric does not like too much excitement when you're. Uh, <laughs> now you can see why <clears> I like driving. to drive. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So there you go. <laughs> <clears throat> so did we answer your question about. I don't, I don't know what people were asking you, but did we answer your question, Eric? I just wanted you to bring it up since okay. so many people sent us that. Mm. Yeah. What do they want from us? Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. We, we get a lot of suggestions. Maybe not, maybe not as much as, as you, but people want us to do all sorts of stuff. And Well, yeah. Yeah. you guys have uh, the equipment and the people who are, who are very knowledgeable and like the, the ability to do things that – is not done frequently on YouTube. Like it's a, it's a really cool space that you're in that you've brought it to YouTube. So I think that like makes people, you know, they want to see stuff that they haven't seen and you guys do that. And so, yeah, it makes sense to me that y'all get a lot of requests. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. That's nice of you to say. And I'm so impressed that you do all of your channel by yourself. I assumed you had <laughs> essentially grown into at least a contract editor or maybe someone does your thumbnails Oh but no! Man, thumbnails. What a waste of time. But yeah, yeah, I do it so important. Myself. And I use I use this really terrible app. This is like this is embarrassing. I use this app called Paint S. Paint.net. Paint.net. Oh, is it like okay? Anyways, this I is thought Paint it was... S. It's like super advanced. This is Mac Paint versus oh. like Windows Paint. Uh, uh. So you can have layers, unlike Windows Paint, which is all one layer. Yeah. Uh, but it's like a three dollar app. 
And it's like, <laughs> I'm loving this. <laughs> this <clears throat> back to the cheap. Yeah. yeah exactly. No. Oh well, my God. like you have, you have a select amount of time in life, right? And you can, you can choose to learn things like Photoshop was like an insanely powerful tool. Uh, and I have used it in the past, but like I, I gave up on it. Paint S is like very simple. It works. I, I, I create the thing and then it's like, all right, here we go. It's, it's in the video, but it is that stuff to me always feels like a waste of time, like working on, but you have to do it. Very thumbnail, I think is very important. Oh, very like important. The, almost the most but important. like creating it the the the, the time yeah. spent creating it feels like a waste of time like it's like why what are you sp spending your life on right now like i'm creating a thumbnail that i think will grab people's attention so that they'll watch my video yeah. uh, versus like back in the day when i started like they're all auto selected by youtube uh, yeah. and like the title is like carburetors explained <laughs> and it's like so boring and it's yeah. just a photo of me which is also very boring and you know it worked then but but now it's now, so much more yeah. competitive so you have to be exciting yeah. That Lexus thumbnail, by the way, has like one of my best click-through rates, uh, which is why it does so well view-wise. Do you know what that was? The click-through rate? Yeah. 20%? Um, no. No. Initially, uh, it was probably floating at around 10 up until maybe 500,000 to a million views. And now it's closer to 3 million views. And I think it's in the 6 That's really good. Range. Wow. But yeah, for, for reference for people listening, like... Normal for my channel probably is like four yeah. percent, three to four percent. And so when you see a number like that, it's exciting because it's like, okay, this is gonna get put in a lot of faces. Unfortunately, it gets put into faces that people that don't care, right? Like not yeah. I wouldn't say the majority of humans care about the difference between a Lexus and a Tesla steering wheel. And so it gets put in front of a lot of faces. Now all these faces click the video, they're like, What what am I watching? Why am I even watching this? And they leave. Um yeah. Yeah, we had a we had a weird phenomenon where one of our videos got promoted by a Google search. It was the top trending video on Google search for wow. external, and we got a half a million views in like two days. For us, it was a lot, and it had a picture of a Cybertruck, no words, nothing, and a red arrow. And um, people love arrows. People love arrows. I learned that from uh, Jerry Rigg. <laughs> something people love when you point it. We pointed <laughs> under, and it said Ooh. like. Eric made the title. It was like a peak underneath the Cybertruck. And we did a 13-minute video off of a one-second screen grab from a video that Tesla released of a Cybertruck yeah. going to crash into a wall mm -hmm. where they showed the uh, it lift up. Briefly? They showed the front cradle and all the suspension oh, okay. with no aero shield. And it was the first time the world had ever seen the substructure of yeah. a of a test of a Cybertruck. So we came in on a Monday, filmed a video of 13 minutes, put very little effort. But one thing that video did, because it had so many external views, very low conversion on uh, subscribers, yeah. uh, very low Watch view time. time. Yeah. So it was a super low. Normally we're at 50%, we're at like 25%. Yeah. Same, and that's the same problem with my Lexus video. Like, uh, and it's it's yeah. doing so poorly revenue wise, which is like bummer because it's like, oh, three million, like probably makes good money. But unfortunately it doesn't because the view is not long enough that you get through multiple ads. Correct. So yeah, yeah it's like, uh, it's exciting because it, it draws growth, like it gets big numbers, all that's great. But it's a bummer because it like, there's some negatives associated with it. Like it, it brings down average watch times, things like that. Yeah. Yeah. And isn't your biggest video about why not to drive your automatic transmission <laughs> in neutral? Is yeah. That, and that it's it? been recreated so many times, both of that. And the, my, my two most popular videos are five things you shouldn't do in, and then change the word automatic or manual transmission. transmission. Two most popular videos. And both of them have been recreated countless times. So now when you search those things, it's somebody else's video. By because you or YouTube someone? picks the newer one, gives preference. Ah. Um, which is lame, but you know, this, Hear that, these, are, these are like the scams of YouTube. Oh, okay. We won't but we're that. all into it. I, I am into that as well. Honestly, I have had people ask me though, like, like a friend of mine asked me, he's like, Hey, is it cool? Um, I should say acquaintance. We're not like super yeah. close. Is it cool if I recreate that video? And it's like, what do you mean? Like <laughs> that's fundamentally lame, like fundamentally lame. Yeah. You can do whatever you want. Like you're an adult, make your own choices. Like it's not copyright. It's just an idea that I had and I put out into the world. But yeah, it's lame. It's lame to just, but you can, you can, you know, you could, if, if all you did, here's, a, here's an idea for someone who wants to get big on YouTube, but, but uh, has no like ethical dilemmas internally. <laughs> <laughs> just go to every, like pick whatever your favorite subject is, find all of the most popular channels, 
sort their videos by most popular and recreate everyone's most popular video. You will do great. You will grow. YouTube doesn't care. YouTube does not give credit to originality. YouTube just says like, oh, this is popular. Promote it. Yeah. So that's a shame. There's very rare. It's very rare to find a unique, a uniquely original content creator Mm -hmm. uh, because most people will, they'll do their own content, but it's something other people do. So yes. reaction videos were big. Like, so everyone's doing reaction. And this is this is even beyond our space, you know, reaction channels. Then you had uh, different styles of, everyone's doing podcasts. So we're doing podcasts. Everyone, a lot of people do Look podcasts. Look at us. But there's this one guy, I think his name's Frankie LaPena. Frankie LaPena. I don't know if you've seen him. He, oh man, nobody knows. You well, my know favorite. more about YouTube than I do, it seems, truthfully. Oh, my God. No, it's more about everything. <laughs> but Frankie, knows all of his <laughs> videos, he self-produces just like you. They are phenomenal. Look it up, Eric. You know, he, he does the squatting videos. He It's funny. It's humor. Great. But none of his videos he, uh, are are grifting anybody else's style or success. They're all like 100% when you see it, like no one has ever done what that's, he's doing. That's the like, coolest. And, and, and so I think that's what everyone should strive yeah. for. It's, it's tough. Yeah. yeah. It's tough to be original, but like striving for that is very cool. I try to do that like mathematically on YouTube because yeah. I feel like there are a lot of things that you can break down mathematically <laughs> that people don't. And so I like that approach because it feels fresh, even though it's like, these are simple fundamental physics concepts. Like these aren't new ideas, but no one does it. And so I think it's like really cool when that kind of like fresh thing can exist and people appreciate it. Yeah. And then the one thing that I think will exist on beyond even the channel is the personalities and the people. So people, they'll see Sandy in an airport. They want to take pictures with him and talk to him. And the relationships that have been formed from, you know, being on the channel and what it, how it's helped our business has been phenomenal. And you probably get recognized all the time. And, and people can try and, you know, copy your stuff, but they can't replace the talent. And I think we have a lot of talent. <laughs> hey. <laughs> Wow. No. Well, I Luckily, I wear boots. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Not many people can replicate me in a whiteboard. <laughs> no, no, seriously. No, I, I get what you're saying. Yeah, like, there's a personality attached to it. I think of it more so because, like, people will ask, like, Jason, do you sell merch? And it's like, I mean, technically, yes. There is a website where you can buy a shirt that has my logo on it, and that logo is trademarked. Like, I, yes, the merch exists. Do I, do I market it ever? No. And like reason being, I think of my channel as like going to school, but, but you have a good teacher. And so if if you go to class and you're like, man, I love this professor. Like he teaches great stuff or this teacher, they teach great stuff. Like they're very, uh, you know, engaging. Do you want to buy a t-shirt from your teacher? No, like nobody wants to buy their teacher's Uh, swag. Well, so that's why yeah, I, I guess you're right. that's why people are like, you say there's a personality attached to it, and there is, but I don't think I think it's more of a student teacher relationship than it is a fan uh idol relationship. Yeah. Like it's very rare for me that someone comes up to me and they're like, um, they're in shock because of like, oh my god, I'm I'm meeting someone popular. It's it's more frequent that it's like, oh man. Love your stuff, like learn all kinds of cool stuff from it. And, and that feels more like if you were to have a professor that you were to, to see outside in the real world, like you're at the grocery store and you bumped in, be like, oh, man, like really yeah. appreciate you, uh, your classes. Like you do a great job. Like that is, is, and that's my ideal. Like I don't like someone who's like fawning. Like that feels gross and weird and I hate it. Um, whatever, like have your own reaction, be who yeah. you are. But yet yeah, it feels to me, I'm like, oh, I don't like this. <laughs> Sandy has had people approach him and start crying oh because they met him. Yeah, grown men have cried. Well, wow, I don't think presence. I've made grown men cry. So uh, congrats. Yeah, we, we had a, a grown man, which we're very appreciative of. Yeah, he he knitted, he really he knitted us this, uh, slippers. Yeah, and mailed them to us. Wow. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and uh, handmade. They were handmade. Uh, we've had uh, we've had people send us stuff that I mean. In my office, there's this fabulous carving that somebody had made, and it's a symbol of what he thought I was. And it's got 
I mean, so uh, you'll have like to have a, a look at it. Phoenix Rising? Yeah, it's, uh, yeah exactly. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, because oh, we, I thought you were telling a joke. I was oh, like, it's basically no. a Schwarzenegger figure, just this real No, dude. no, it's, <laughs> it's really well done, and he, it's all hand-carved. It's, like, wow. amazing. I get a lot of stuff like that. I mean, I... I don't have an address that I just like, like a P.O. box or anything like that. I mean, I have a business I don't address, even know I'm how they found it. Well, the, the well, thing our, is they sent it to the company. Our address yeah. is yeah. public. Yeah. 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 yeah, so it comes in, uh, and I, I, I mean, I've offered to pay for some of the things that, uh, that people have uh, kind of cranked. And no, no, That's I just cool. want you to have this. Crap, it must have taken like months to, to, to do what some of these people have. I did have a guy, I was at the zoo, and this guy sitting on a bench with his girlfriend, and he literally like leaps up and starts jumping because he was so excited to meet me. And then he like started explaining oh. it to his girlfriend, who like clearly had no interest. And I was like, "Yeah, like I'm sorry, like it's it's not a big deal, and <laughs> your reaction is the correct one." And yeah, anyways, <laughs> enjoy the zoo. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. Fun. All right, well, this has been great. Thanks, Just finish Dick. it off yeah, with maybe a little toilet discussion. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, well, there may be some things on the. Uh, what is it? The editing floor, or whatever it is. But uh, but anyways, yes. Thanks very much for coming by. I really appreciate it. I will be having a look at that uh, that one video um, for sure on the yokes uh, between the two. Just have a look because uh, I think that Tesla probably should move away from what they've got and move toward the uh, uh, the same sort of a deal where you limit the amount of. Uh, travel yeah, you need in order wire. to turn the corner yes it's here by wire lexus I, has I, a little bit of a delay in it which that to me is like critical to get out mm. it's not production yet so i don't know what no. it'll be but okay. yeah. there is a slight delay uh and then I'll, i just want to say this because i also really appreciate y'all having me here and one of the things i think like youtube wasn't taken insanely seriously in 2011 uh like when, when i was getting started and it has it has grown and so it's it's grown so much that it's attracted like real genuine experts that that don't do this for a living like my engineering career was cut very short in that you know i stopped working as an engineer in 2014 i was like hey youtube could be something that exists and now it is something that can coexist with companies and so what i think is very cool this is like you know this second generation of youtube channels like what y'all have where you're bringing your fundamental expertise that you've had all along it, it didn't exist on YouTube. And now all of this like rich information that's stored, you know, behind closed walls is now getting brought to this platform that is free and public. Like, I think it's insanely cool. So I have great appreciation for y'all bringing this educational content to YouTube. I think it's incredible. Well, thank wow. you. Thank you so much. That's very high praise. So yeah, it's very nice of you to say. Yeah, it, it really is. Yeah. So um, Corey started it off, but uh, I, I guess I'll wrap it up. I, I really appreciate you coming down. Um, I, I guess we've mentioned um, um, engineering explained like to everybody. I'm pretty sure most of our, our viewers are also viewers of yours. And uh, this has been <laughs> the, the hour and a half like flew by. I, yeah, it was fun. I, I, I really did. I had a good time. So thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate it. Yeah, likewise. And, thank uh, you. Hopefully, uh, hopefully we'll do it again. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds right. great. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And thank you all for watching. Thank you.